This inspired Insider.com interviews with Daria Rose, creator of Summer Tomato, which is Time's 50 Best Websites of 2011, also author of Foodist. Listen how she talks about what her dad did. They actually decreased his blood pressure by half and actually was able to poke holes in his belt. She also talks about this amazing experiment that was done, research about people's willpower. This will blow your mind. It's worth its weight in gold. That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Dr. Daria Rose, who's the creator of SummerTomato.com, which is one of Time's 50 best websites of 2011, and the author of The Foodist, which she's gonna talk about today. She received her PhD in neuroscience from UC San Francisco and her bachelor's degree in molecular and cell biology from Berkeley. Thanks for being here, Daria. My pleasure, it's great to be here. I always like to include a fun fact, and you willingly offered this one. Fun fact about Daria is she won the eighth grade burping competition. So that's one of my favorite fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> so the topic today is how do we go from that idea to gaining raving fans and helping people make permanent changes in health? And in your case, how'd you go from having that idea to creating a website, Summer Tomato, you know, times 50 best websites, and went on to create the book Foodist that inspires many to live a healthier life. And first of all, what inspired you to get your PhD and then starting Summer Tomato? Well, I mean, I was always interested in science and specifically I was interested in neurodegenerative diseases because I think they're really horrible and sad and I just don't like the idea of them existing. So I've always sort of had this drive to help people live better and age better and have a higher quality of life. I think that's in my core. That's probably what drives me. Um, so I was doing that. I ended up deciding to go into research instead of medicine. And But then I got into school and, you know, the funding was really tough at that time. And I just started, I started getting disillusioned with my career path. I wasn't certain. That, you know, I looked around and I was like, I don't know if I want to grow up and be these people still begging the government for money every single year. <laughs> so I you know, talked to some friends and I spoke one friend in particular and he was like, well, you know, you're, you're, you're into this health thing. Why don't you like figure that out? That's a much more lucrative prof profession. And, uh, you know, let's see if we can do something there. And so I just started digging into the science of, of health and weight loss and nutrition and sort of came up with my theory, my, my theory that was enough for me to decide that I wanted to start writing. Cause I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't really know how how to change careers. Like that sounds. That's tough. You know. What it's was like, your I, background in? Like, what were you getting your PhD in? Yeah. So my background is in neuroscience. So mm -hmm. I was like looking around, going like, okay. So PhD sounds like you're employable, right? But like, For really, sure. at the end of the day, I know how to work a microscope. I know how to like raise mice in a lab. I know how to look at their brains. <laughs> you know, like I know all sorts of geeky things, but like I couldn't go get a job at like Google or some place where you could actually have a real career. So, you know, I felt sort of confused, but um, so I just decided to start writing and see how it would go. And so my, inspire, my inspiration was sort of, well, I don't have anything to lose because I know I, otherwise I'm just going to be like working my butt off all the time. So I just started writing. So going from your PhD to starting the Summer Tomato blog, obviously you know, it's not like a technical background. What did you do first to get started with that? Well, first I had to discover what a blog was because I had no idea come 2007. Um, I, somebody had visited, I was writing for the newspaper at school, at school at the time and someone had visited and told us a little bit about his blog that was pretty popular and I was like, well that's kind of cool. Um, and then like I, I, just, I just started thinking about it and I think a week later I like logged in a blog, blogger, blog, blogspot.com, those ones, and I, um, I was like, I'm going to try this thing. I didn't, I, I didn't really understand anything anything I didn't know SEO was like letters I'd never heard put together before and um, and I kid you not this is a true story I um, I wanted I just decided one day like I had this meal like I went to the farmers market 
which was sort of my big inspiration. And I bought something I would have never bought before. It was these adorable little cabbages. And like, cabbage sounds so boring, right? But these were so cute. They were little and crinkly. And I was like, I have to buy these just because they're cute. Like, I don't even know how they're gonna taste. And I brought them home and I made some recipe up out of my brain. I was not that, I was an okay cook, not a great chef or anything. And it was amazing. It was so good. And I was like, people have to know about this. Because it also, by the way, it was $1.50 for like five little baby cabbages. So I like sit down at my computer and I decide I'm gonna like create this blog and tell people about my cabbages. <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, I start trying to get a URL, you know, and for bl dot blogspot.com. And like, I'm like, okay, I thought for like 10 minutes about a good blog name, like food life, that sounds good. And so I try to get that and it's like, nope. And I'm like, oh, okay, what about this one? And it's like, nope. And I got like, I tried like five things in a row and it was just like, nope, nope, nope. I had no idea because I'd never used like, social media before basically that um, all the URLs are taken. And I, I've, at a certain point I was like, I think this is broken. I think, <laughs> I think I just try something that's like so random that like it has to be available. I just want to see if this works. So I don't know. It just came to me like summer tomato. And that is a good like, one. And it was like, congratulations, you have your new site. And I'm like, you can't change it. Like once you pick it, you can't change it. So um, here we are. That's great. <laughs> What's been, I want to, we'll hear more about Foodist and kind of what you did with Summer Tomato, but looking back, what's been a painful low point for you in your career or before you got started? Yeah, for me, the, probably the toughest thing was just being in school and not having, and, and like having that realization that I didn't have skills that translated to any other job. And I mean, except critical thinking, and which ended up being what I used, but it was a really scary moment because, um, well, my dad had gotten really sick. I had, like, and he was in the hospital for, like, health-related things, ironically. Like, I wasn't even that into health at the time. He'd, uh, he'd had a stroke. He'd had mm -hmm. pneumonia. He had a really bad staph infection. And, like, he kept going to the hospital. It was really scary. And I'd already lost my mom in 2003 from a car accident. And I was like, I'm in school. Like, I'm far away from home. I don't know what I want to do. I have no money. I feel like I don't have any skills and like I might not have any parents at all soon. It was just like this really, I don't know, I felt very alone and it was really scary. And um, yeah, I'm, I feel very blessed right now that like none of the bad things that could have happened happened yet, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. so what did you do? Like when you thought of that moment, you're like, you know, you're in this for, you've been in school for a while and you weren't sure what to do. What did you end up doing at that time? Yeah, the way I looked at it was, well, I didn't, I couldn't drop out. Like, it was like, I didn't want to quit. Like, I'd already passed my qualifying exam, which is anybody who's gone to grad school or done a PhD you knows that's, like, yeah. by far the hardest part. So I'm not going to, like, it's stupid to drop out of a place where you have, you know, money and healthcare and everything there for you to have nothing. Like, I, I couldn't, have, I could have, like, maybe I could get a job at Starbucks. I don't know, you know, <laughs> something like that. So, um I wanted, I knew I wanted to do something else. I knew I was very, you know, scrappy. And so I was like, well, I want to go into the career, but I didn't think anyone would take me seriously because my background was neuroscience. So I was interested in fitness and health and like dieting sort of things and nutrition. And uh, so I just started writing. My, my theory, like actually, <laughs> this is a good story too. I actually um, called Michael Pollan. I don't know if you know who he is, but he wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I found out he was at Berkeley. So I called him and I was like, hey, I used to go to Berkeley. <laughs> I was like, I, I'm looking to get into a new career path, but like, I don't know if anybody will take me seriously. And he was like, you know what, just start writing and pretty soon you'll be an expert. And I was like, all right. So I started writing. And like, it, and it, was, a, it was definitely a gamble, I'd say. I mean, not really. I, I was using my time, but I didn't have anything to do any, otherwise. And so I just feel very lucky that by the time I graduated, I did really have a new career. But like I just, I don't know. I I had no idea that was going to be the case. But I felt like I had nothing to lose. Yeah. Blogging and you know when you market marketing on social media is free. It just takes time and effort. Right. So I mean that takes a lot of guts though, because someone listening may be thinking the same thing in their career. They've been doing the same thing for six years, and they're like, I can't change because I have no other marketable skills. So kind of hearing that from you, you be like, oh well, maybe you know there is you know they can change. They can reach out to someone. What's after that low point? What's 
one of those big milestones or a moment that you're especially proud of? Yeah, I, this, um, uh, it's kind of a, it's a very personal story, but I, I, you know, I explained I had these, my dad had these health issues and I ended up getting really into nutrition and obviously starting a blog and started writing and, um, I'd already gotten my book deal actually. No, 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 I hadn't. Um, but I was working on my proposal and, uh, this is actually right before I graduated and I, I had done, you know, I'd been writing about health and nutrition for years and my dad, you know, he read it because he was like my dad and he's a good dad, but he never, I never expected him to change. He was eating terribly. He had prediabetes and, you know, he basically ate fast food all the time. And one day he just calls me out of the blue and he was like, you know, that video you made the other day about salt, that was great. And I was like, oh, thanks dad. He was like, yeah, it really hit me. He was like, you know, he made me realize something and that's that the salt is already inside the processed food. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know. It was like really, I like couldn't believe that he was saying this because I was like, where, where did you, what? Um, and he was like, yeah, so I, I stopped eating it. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he was like, well, I know you said I'm supposed to eat vegetables. So I went to the store and I, I just bought all of them. I'm like, what did you buy? You bought all the vegetables? And he was like, yeah, well, they weren't very well labeled. So I'm not sure what I got. I think I got some chard, maybe some kale, maybe some spinach. You know, he just, he was That's like. That's a big like, jump. Yeah, and he didn't even know what he was buying, and he went and he went home and he cooked it all. As he said, it took him like an hour to cut it up. There was so much because he he's changed his routine, but then he just like made this giant stir fry, and he was like, and I cooked it up some fish and I ate it with it. And he was like, it was so good. He was like, I haven't eaten anything but that like for like breakfast or for like lunch and dinner for two weeks. He's wow. like, I had to poke new holes in my belt. I was like. Like he had never told me he was doing any of this, and like suddenly it had been two weeks. He'd only eaten vegetables and fish, and had lost twenty pounds or something like crazy. Huh. And um, you know, and like his blood pressure is half what it used to be. Like from that, I mean, he still has health issues because diabetes is serious, you know. But to have him of like he was depressed. He was he, like I said, we all must thought we were going to lose him multiple times, and for him to have that kind of turnaround, I feel like he's by far. My number one success story. That's mm. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe through osmosis, him just listening to you all these years, so just it sunk in and it just hit him. Yeah. And then there was this click, and you know, I, I write about this in the book. Like, I don't think if I would have just shown him that video from the get go, that it would have had the same impact. Right. I think you have to sort of be delicate, and then one day hope for that epiphany. There's one story I remember hearing, and um, I wonder if you could tell it about the the editor that read your book. Oh yeah, so um, I had a friend uh, from college actually that he was he was always a really good writer, and I have a lot of respect for his opinion. And I know that he's not afraid to call out my bullshit. You know, <laughs> he he'll call me out and criticize me gladly. And I know he's not particularly interested in my topic. So I asked him when I first started writing if he'd be willing to read my chapters as I was turning them out. And it was my first pass before going to the publisher with any of it and my, my real editors. Um, and he was like, sure. So he started reading, you know, told me he enjoyed it. And uh, I hadn't heard from him for a while. But then after, you know, a couple months after I'd finished, I got an email from him saying, Hey, uh, is your book out yet? And I was like, oh, no, 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 it'll be a couple more months. And he was like, oh, yeah, because I'd accidentally, uh, well, I didn't realize it, but I lost 15 pounds after reading it. He's like, I didn't even know I had 15 pounds to lose. Wow. Now that I've seen it, I'd really like to kind of go back and like actually internalize that stuff because I was just, he was just reading it for like grammar and interestingness and right. literary crick, uh, criticism. And, uh, but yeah, no, he totally accidentally lost 15 pounds from reading my book. So what do you think, what did he say, was there a portion that influenced him the most in the book or did he just read it and kind of just start implementing like step-by-step -step things? I, that, yeah, he just like, because it, it was very, it was like they crept into his habits, you know, it's all about habit forming and how to shift that balance from slightly less healthy to slightly more healthy. So it's not this drastic diet overhaul and I think he, he started, he said he started act, eating more mindfully. Uh, which means like slowing down, chewing more. He said he started eating less processed stuff, like less, a little less bread, fewer chips, more vegetables, but sort of, I think he started walking more. I think he got the Fitbit. Um, but sort of what sound like my, minor changes, it's sort of unbelievable that he had such a drastic, 
result from not really trying that hard. But I think that goes to show the power of creating habits and using this method of trying to lose weight and get healthy instead of some fad diet that yeah. is not going to work after another couple of weeks. For sure. What's been the biggest challenges with, I mean, you, you were PhD, you're running Summer Tomato, then you're writing Foodist. What's been a huge challenge for you? Uh, there's, I mean, obviously there's a ton of huge challenges when you're completely going into a new field when you don't know anything. Early on, my biggest challenge was not being totally broke. <laughs> I mean, I was, I had so little money. I wanted to start, uh, I, I wanted, shortly after creating the blog spot, blogger blog, I realized that I, I needed to take this more seriously because I was getting such great feedback from my readers and it was refining my ideas. And I wanted to create summertomato.com. So I bought the domain, it was available, 15 bucks. But I couldn't afford a designer. And I didn't want to use like a generic theme on WordPress. I wanted it to look professional, you know. And so I basically like I took some like some free themes and I started like borrowing some code. And I basically taught myself HTML and CSS to get a site up. Like I didn't pay anybody. Wow. It took me three months. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> and um, I guess, I guess. I mean, it is. It was hard. Uh, I did pay for a logo. That was the only thing I paid for. And, you know, so that was tough. And I just like worked my butt off on nights and weekends. I did nothing. You know, that's one advantage of being broke is you can't really do anything else. So I just stay home and do that. And um, and then just being low on time too. You know, I was getting a PhD during the day. I was in lab all day. So I and then I, I never cut out the cooking or the going to the gym. So you know I'd basically start I put myself in a very rigorous schedule to start. Like I was like I have to publish four times a week on these schedules. Yeah. And I would just, I'd stay up till two, three in the morning if I had to, to make sure I hit those schedules just to make it look like I, like make it look like this was a serious thing, you know? And I think that having that discipline early on was key to making everything work. So yeah, time and money. I think that <laughs> that's the normal a, stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's an excuse most people make. And even at the time, you're eating pretty healthy. How do you do that? I think probably a common question you get is, well, I don't have the time or the money to do this, but it sounded like you were still eating pretty healthy then. Yeah, I always call call people out on that. Yeah. I'm like, you definitely had the time and money. It's a matter of priorities. So, you know, you don't have to eat elaborate, like, grass-fed beef things every night. I was, most of the time, like, scrambling some eggs and some, like, kale. You know, it was like a $4, no, two, $3 dinner. Um, and it takes about seven minutes to cook. You know, it's just like you figure out ways. Like I was eating a lot of lentils. And I, when I would have little splurges, it was on food. You know, it was on fish. It was on beef. It was on things that I enjoyed. And I mean, that, those were money splurges is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and I just didn't go out. You know, it's tough. You know, I didn't have kids, obviously. But I was, you know, working serious lab hours. Right. And Those science labs I know are strenuous. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I just I didn't sleep a lot, and I worked really hard on weekends. Like it was hard, you know. Your friends ask you, "Let's go, let's go, go to a bar tonight. Let's go grab dinner," and I'm like, "Not, I, I got work yeah. to do, man." <laughs> so, Daria, so um, what made you decide to write Foodist? Because I mean, I've gone on your blog, I've gone on watch your videos you someone can't get through all those i mean there's so many so what uh inspired you to write foodist well i'd always like i said i always wanted to create something that was i felt can help people and the blog is great and it's these little nuggets of information but it doesn't really give you a full picture i mean one of the i think when people come to the site from a random link maybe they saw a retweet or something they've never seen me before usually they read it and like this is great how do I start? You know, I mean, it's like it's like they want a guide to like they want a diet book at the end of the day, you know, because they want something that'll take them through. They want a plan, and it's basically what it is, you know. And it, it consolidates a lot of the information in Summer Tomato. You know, it's it's the same content in a lot of in a lot of ways. It's just put together in a way that's easier to follow and is, I think, more appealing to a broad audience. Like right now, I very much appeal to people in tech. You know, people already in health and already online, but a physical book gets into someone's home. You know, your friends see it at the office. It's it's a little more, it's a little different. It's more personal, and it's something I'd always wanted to do. Shortly after starting the blog, I realized that that was a goal of mine. 
Yeah, and I know when we have an audience that is asking questions or engaging, we get feedback maybe we don't expect. Was there some feedback that influenced you from some of your audience? Yeah, that was a huge factor for me, actually. So I felt like I sort of wanted to write a book right away, but nobody would give me a book deal. And I'm really glad for that, actually. You know, you think, oh, if I could just do this, then I could just get a book deal. But And then the blog sounds like a lot of people don't want to start a content marketing blog because they feel like it's a lot of work and they don't want to put in that work. But the reality is that that work you put in is how you get good. It's how you know exactly what people want. I have all the metrics on who clicks on what posts, how many reshares, how many comments every post gets, right. what questions I get. You know, and what happened was I learned, so I just assumed, I knew that people wanted to learn about science. Like they wanted to know whether or not it was the carbs or the fat or what was gonna, really going to work. Turns out that's not really the case. There are a few people where that's the case. I was one of those people, which is why I thought everybody was one of those people. Right. But the, most people, I realized, and I learned from the blog, just want to know what to do. They, they don't want you to translate science into English. They want you to translate science into action, something that they can do when they get up in the morning and like feel like they're accomplishing something. So, I mean, that is a, qu- a quick shift. I mean, within two months of blogging, I shifted to action-based, actionable tips. And that's how I created a body of evidence, or body of literature, in content and also um, I learned people's problems that I don't have you know it's like I have my like grad student issues mm. you know I'm busy I'm broke I've got these problems but I live in San Francisco I have farmers markets everywhere mm. we, they're open all year long so you know I got to talk to people in other parts of the country who have different problems and assimilate all that information that I learned into one book that is really and in the blog it's just a much richer experience because of my readers which is I think what what makes social media so cool you know it's like if I was just writing a newspaper column like I would never get that feedback except for the you know the random crazy not interactive yeah (laughs) right through the letter so yeah I think I would I I owe my readers everything they're my number one person I acknowledged in my acknowledgments in my book what's one of those big problems that you remember someone writing about and you're like I would have never thought of that well any of those yeah, there's tons. I mean, I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have is a lot of people, especially in the middle of the country, think, I don't have a farmer's market. I live in Detroit. Try to find a farmer's market here. Well, I had another reader come to me and say, hey, could I do a farmer's market update from New- Detroit? And it turns out they have an amazing farmer's market. That person had just never looked. And, you know, so I, I realized that a lot of people make assumptions and they create barriers in their minds that don't really exist. And so what I can do is I realize that the same, you know, people make these same issues over and over again. And so I'll write a post or whatever and show them how easy it is, how much easier it is than they thought. And what that does is that lowers how difficult it seems and encourages people to actually try things. So how did you actually get the, you mentioned early on that you were reaching out to try and get the book deal. What ended up happening? How did you end up um, getting that solidified? Yeah, that uh, was really wonderful. <laughs> wonderful things happened. The blog started getting popular, which was great. Uh, I started, I think, with, I don't really know. Well, early on, I got some mentions in some bigger magazine. I got mentioned in the New York Times early on, but it was always me reaching out. I did a lot of guest posts on other people's blogs, and I just started spreading the word. I was very active on social media and made a lot of good friends. And um, Actually, they came. Agents started approaching me about a book, a possibility of doing a book even before I graduated. My my plan was always to like wait till I had finished the darn thesis, you know, because that's obviously Big a undertaking. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to finish my thesis, but I had three or four agents reach out to me um, before that and say, "Hey, we're interested." And I think when I real when I knew it was really real was um, my the agent I ended up signing with. Uh, her name is Lisa. She was Seth Godin's agent back when he had agents, and um, and she was like, "Yeah, this is, these are the people I represented." And I just like looked at her resume and I was like, "And you want to represent me? Cool. I, was like, I will call you as soon as my thesis is done." So um, yeah, so I, I you know I was the, basically the second I graduated, I jumped headfirst into my book proposal and worked on it for six months it's, it's a hard all of this stuff is hard but like going to a PhD yeah. yeah but it's shorter than a six oh. year thesis <laughs> what was your thesis oh I worked on uh, the role of WIMP signaling and neural stem cell development 
super fancy stuff. Yeah, it's very fancy. <laughs> What's something that you wrote about that created controversy or that you got some debate or pushback from other professionals over? There, this is a tricky one in, in my world. There's a lot. I mean, there's so right. much controversy in the diet world. I think the biggest issues I've had with people like trying to really pick fights with me, basically, um, the biggest one's probably, I've actually shifted my position quite a bit on saturated fat. Early on, I, I, I followed a lot of epidemiological studies that showed that saturated fats weren't so great. Not that they were as bad as they'd always told us, but I definitely still avoided meat, I would say. And I've really come around on that. I hmm. eat meat a lot now, actually, and I've my cholesterol has only improved. And I, I've really gotten to the point where I don't believe that stuff anymore. I, I try to get high quality beef because I think what the toxins that accumulate in the fat is my biggest fear at this point. But I've had definitely had some people want to pick some fights with me about that. Uh, the other big one is, uh, the, I don't know, I guess most people by now know about the paleo, the paleo Other diet people thing. do, yeah. Um, so they're, they're very anti-grain and, very, and they don't eat beans and lentils, legumes. And I'm a big proponent of both. I don't do the whole grain flour. I, I encourage intact grains, but I've had the wrath of paleo people <laughs> like really? descend upon my blog and like argue with me about how much better their lives are without grains and I'm like well that's great for you but I like to travel like I like you know cutting out lentils and rice and beans and like soy basically eliminates the entire earth's cuisine right like, people like, get very oh. passionate about what they do too especially yeah. when it comes to diet it's like a religion in, in a lot of <laughs> circles so you know I I tell people, you know, if it works for you, I'm not going to tell you to do otherwise. This works for me, and I think it'll work for others a little easily, more easily than like cutting out all of the cuisines on Earth. So, mm. yeah, I've definitely had a few people argue with me, but I welcome it. I Comes mean, with the because, territory. Yeah, and also like smart people come out of the woodworks. I mean, you, it's easy to talk to re recognize someone who really doesn't know what they're talking about, and I'm really just kind of a troll. You know, when you're when you know the when you're well versed in your subject, like I know I know the stuff pretty well. So right. you know I know who's who has a good point and who doesn't. And I just I talk to the smart people and I learn a lot from it actually. And yeah. they learn. You know we we learn from each other. Yeah, those are good ones. What's a piece of research about health that wowed you that you read and you're like, this is this actually true? Yeah, I've got one. You'll think the same thing. I one of the things that blew my mind, and I, it's not a diet thing. But I think that the diet world can learn a lot from this lesson. Mm -hmm. And that is the sort of amazing fact that smoking cigarettes protects against heart Parkinson's disease. How crazy is that? Like it, you know, obviously kills you from lung cancer and promotes heart disease and all these other things. Right. But it ha the nicotine actually has a protective effect on a certain area of your brain hmm. that Parkinson's disease attacks. And I think that in food, especially in nutrition and diet, we tend to get very black and white. This is good, this is bad. And biology doesn't work that way. And I think that Parkinson's nicotine connection is a very good illustration of that. Sometimes we have an adaptive reason we like something bad. You know, same thing, there's another one. Um, malaria uh, actually is sort of protective against sickle cell anemia. Or no, sickle cell anemia is sort of protective against malaria. So, but you don't, like it's a special ratio. But it's the same sort of thing. It's like, yes, that's bad. And, but like there's a gray area where a little bit of it might be good and I think when you talk about eliminating the entire food groups and when you sit when you extrapolate from one study to like all of the universe you mm. run into problems like this and I think that the nutrition community especially could benefit from remembering that that happens in biology so not, what do they recommend from the study do they recommend then if it's nicotine do they recommend just people getting the gum or something or is that like do people actually prescribe that or is that not really like a well-known study? No, it's not a study. It's like there's a body of literature. Oh, okay. There's hundreds of studies showing okay. that nicotine. And the question is like, what's the mechanism? How does it work? Yeah, does, can we use it to prevent? You know, maybe you're genetic. Maybe you can do a genetic test and you find out you're inclined toward Parkinson's disease, or you know it runs in your family. Both mm -hmm. your grandparents had it. You know, it, it's it's tough. You know, yeah, maybe the gum's a good idea. I mean, I don't know. I don't think the gum causes cancer. I <laughs> Cigarettes do. I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't pick up 
regular smoking. But, you know, these are just, it, I, it, it's not meant to be instructional. It's meant to, I, I think it's interesting as an illustration of how you can't take too much from one fact. You know, you've got to take the context of right. the, the universe. What's been your favorite story or piece of research that you included in The Foodist? Um, I love this story. Uh, I, I did, uh, so some of the research that I did when, um, when writing the book that I hadn't spent much time talking about on Summer Tomato, I hinted at it, but I really dove into the re research on willpower and the psychology that goes behind like the dieter's brain. They're actually very different from normal people's brains. And I, I assumed that because I dieted for so long and I could tell in myself when I stopped that my psychology was different, but I really dove into the literature and the scientific literature and I found this really amazing study. Basically, these researchers, they like to take, like, play tricks on college students, it's cool. Like, I, I, I kind of want to be in one of these labs where you just like, like trick psych, they usually have their psychology students too, which is great. Anyway, they invited three groups of students into the lab and they basically had them watch movies or something like that and they gave them a bowl of M&M's. And they asked the, th the students three different things. In one group, they just said, they didn't say anything. They just said, you know, have a, there's a, here's some M&Ms if you want to watch them while you're eating or while, well, eat them while you're watching. The other group, they said, here's some M&Ms, but um, you don't have any. Try, try to tell yourself you shouldn't, you, you can't have any ever. No, no M&Ms for you. And then the third group, they said, don't tell yourself you can't have any right now, but tell yourself you can have some later and think about it that way during the, during the film. And then after the experiment, so they measured how much they ate during the experiment. No, I don't think anybody was totally perfect, maybe a few people. Um, but then they ha afterwards, they brought them in and they pretended this was like nonchalant. And they, they said, oh, you know, you're the last person that today. They're like filling out a survey, like supposedly about the quality of the film or something. And they're like, these are left over. You're free to have as many as you want. And they really expected the people who had told themselves they could have it later to like kind of go crazy. Right. And they thought that the people that were told they couldn't have it at all would be like primed for like good behavior. It turned out the opposite was true. It turned out that the people who told themselves they had it, they could have it later just had a few. And the people who told themselves they could never have it went nuts. Hmm. They actually ended up eating more than the people who ate freely during the film. Isn't wow. that crazy? That's interesting. And, and that is the dieter's mentality. Right, the, that that the dieter is the person who says I can never have this. Whereas, so so there's two things you can gain from this study. One is never diet. <laughs> but you, what, a trick you can use if you don't want to, you know, eat eat too much, mm -hmm. is just tell yourself you can have it later. Yeah. And what's amazing is that, about this is that it actually that it cut cravings. They did follow up uh, surveys with these people. It cut cravings for up to a week. It lasts for a week. You know what? Yeah. That's really interesting. And like even as a like a parent. Like, you know, you always worry about your kids like eating healthy foods or not healthy foods. And to me, it's like, well, you should never tell the child you can't have this. You should always tell them you can have it later. They may get like a complex or something. I wonder if right. that. Yeah. Interesting. What's been a part of the book that you feel you struggle with most that you maybe fall off the bandwagon on? Yeah, there's a few. It, it's tough. I think that the most difficult thing historically for me has been the mindful eating chapter and that's something that's newer to me like when I first started writing about this stuff mindfulness wasn't on my radar really as an important thing I was very much focused on the nutrition but over time I realized that there's really a lot of things you can do to influence how much you want to eat which is incredibly powerful when you think about it that way so Basically, I learned that like you can, you know, if you if you are more mindful, you can you can adjust how you how you interact with your food environment. And but it's really tough to do in our like super distracted, super multitasking lives. Yeah. And it's very easy to sit down and just you know have your phone out or like have your laptop open and just shovel food in your mouth and not think about it. And even if you don't have your laptop open, you know, me and my husband sometimes find ourselves like frantically eating dinner as if like the wolves are going to come <laughs> get it or something. And and like I'll have to be like, "Whoa, like let's like put our forks down and like have a glass of wine and like chill out." <laughs> and um I think that's just really tough because of our environment, the way we just train ourselves to multitask all the time and to do everything really efficiently. So that's been really tough for me. This, the other thing that's kind of more tough lately, when I was a grad student, like cooking at home was 
easy because I couldn't afford to do anything else. But these days, I've got a lot more social obligations and a little bit more money. So it's it's really easy sometimes. You have more options. Like, yeah. Let's go out to dinner. Um, and so I have to stay on myself to, to make sure that I don't get lazy about the home cooking. That's a good one. <laughs> What's the top thing you tell the audience to do right now to influence a loved one to be healthier or to stick to being healthier themselves? Because that tends to be you know, more of a challenge. It's not like making that change and making it more of a permanent change, like kind of like what you did with your dad. Yeah. It, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, it can be tricky. It's really, really tricky because you're dealing with somebody you love and you care about, obviously. You, it, you know, you kind of want to like strangle them and be like, do this, it's good for you. But you can't. You can't treat people that way. And also, you don't want to strain your relationship with them. Like that's, for me, that was a big one with my dad. Like, you know, I, he was like, he, he would say sometimes that he didn't really want to live anymore. And, you know, it's like, oh. I don't want to like spend our last years together fighting over his blood pressure. You know what I mean? And so it's tough. It's really tricky. You want to help so bad. But the way I was able to help him was by being very positive and by, you know, I never preached, but what I did was I would start just bringing food over to the house and cooking something delicious for him. And it was always healthy, but I didn't say, Hey, this is healthy. You should eat it. I said, you got to try this. This is delicious. I got it right from the farmer's market. This guy grows it. He's amazing. You know, I just, you tell a story about the food, make it sound special, cook it, make it taste good and make somebody interested in what you care about. And that's, I, I don't, I just don't think you could ever win just trying to force something like that down people's throats. And, and, you know, you just learn by, you teach by example and you share those moments and they pick up one thing, they pick up another thing. And, you know, the, the problem is like, you just hope it's soon enough. Right. But, yeah. you know, there's, I don't think, I really don't think there's any other way to do it. It's not an easy way to navigate that. Yeah. yeah. I think the language you use matters a lot too. Like, like, like I was saying, like, I don't call it healthy. Like, call it tasty. You know, Got it. People, that's a good one. Yeah, Yeah, because 90% of people, and that's, like, not a number I'm making up. It's, there's, there's data on this. About 90% of people, like, think healthy is kind of a bad word. Like, Interesting. It's, they, they reject it. They assume two things. They assume it's not going to taste as good. Right. And they will assume that it's going to be less filling. So they're going to need to eat. They end up eating more later. And, um, and if you just say something's healthy, you're priming that. You're priming somebody to reject what you've given them. So... Never use that word. <laughs> Just never use it. Love it. That's Delicious. great. So what other tools or systems do you use in your life and business to kind of stay on track? Yeah. Um, in business or in, in health? In health, business. Oh, I mean, we, when you're in yours, it's the same thing, right? So. I guess that's true. Um, well, forcing myself to write and forcing myself to chew are I gotcha. different problems. But, um, <laughs> But I would say, so, so in, in specific tools, like I'm a huge fan. I talk about the Fitbit all the time. I, I think that 10,000 steps a day is a total game changer for health and weight loss. And I'm a big, big fan. And I've found that the more, like if I get closer to 15,000 steps a day, I can like eat anything I want. It's really? pretty amazing. That's what I do on vacation. Like that's how I like go to France and eat baguettes all day is I walk the entire time. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. I mean, I think that monitoring in general if if you can do it in a way that's not neurotic, which is what's nice about the Fitbit, is great. So I also love the Withing scale, which is the uh, it's like a digital scale that like records like and graphs out your your body weight. Hmm. And you know you just step on that every day. Like you don't. It's not because you're you want to be neurotic and you're looking at the number, but it keeps you educated on like what how your behavior is impacting. Your, your physique. Yeah. And so that's a big one for me. Um, I also use the Lyft app. It's lyft.do mm -hmm. is their URL, which is a habit building app. And it's pretty cool. Like I've actually discovered, I started using it for all sorts of crazy things. Um, I mean, at first I started to help use it to help me remember to chew and whatever. But now I'm like, every time I come up with something that I'm like proud of myself doing a little bit, like oh, I started a book today, you know, I'll, I'll add that as a habit. So it's something I can track and be proud of, you know? And then I think well, what's cool about that though, is that you learn to maintain habits that can very, even though you enjoy them, they can very easily fall out of your rota rotation. Right. And I found that just having that list there keeps me on the ball. And, you know, I, and I know that if I'm getting around, well, my list is pretty long now, but if I'm hitting around half of those a day, 
I'm like, good. Like I'm, I'm eating healthy. I'm like on top of my mental game. I'm on top of my physical game and I'm probably calling my mom and, or my dad and telling him I love him more and stuff like that. So That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. I remember I'm a huge proponent of the Fitbit too. And I remember it's amazing that how it helps you change behavior. Cause I, you know, obviously like it's a social component. So you see who's on the leaderboard. And I remember it was like one in the morning I was doing something and I saw someone was like 200 steps more than me. So I literally just one in the morning just started running in place to, cause I wanted to, to beat them. So it definitely helps change behavior. Yeah. What, what's, um, a question that we didn't talk about so far that uh is interesting from your journey with foodist um oh right uh, i actually so i'd never written a book before but i've always been a student as you can imagine i was 30 when i finally finished school <laughs> in school for a long time and uh, when, when we first, you know, when we first started negotiating my book contract, uh, they were, you know, we were talking and they said, you know, we, you know, well, you're a new author, so, you know, it'll, we don't want to put too much pressure on you. We'll, we'll have it come out in like a few years or something like that. They're like, but if you wanted to get it out a year early, you could turn it in like a year early. And I was like, interesting. And like, so I sat down and I finished, basically sat down and I wrote the book cover to cover and I finished nine months early. Wow. That probably never happens for people with books. I don't think it's ever happened in the history of mankind. Well, how long is your thesis? <laughs> it's probably really long. Oh, no. No, no. That's not too long. The de- book is definitely longer. Okay. So tell us a little bit, Daria, about um, a little bit more about the Foodist and about Summer Tomato, what you're most excited about recently. Oh, gosh, I'm, there's a few things. I'm really excited about the audiobook coming out. Um, I'm, I'm recording it next week, so that, that'll be coming up here in a couple months. Um, I'm just, I'm actually really excited to get back into blogging. I've been finally blogging again. Like, I, I was not as involved with the blog when I was writing the book. I realized there's this capacity for writing that you cannot exceed, no matter how much free time you have. I just was, like, spent. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I've been doing a lot of podcasts and interviews. I don't know. I'm kind of I feel like I went from working my butt off in Berkeley to working my butt off at UCSF to getting my PhD to writing my book proposal to writing my book and then I just got married and then I had the book launch. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm like, I feel like I have like this much like creative resources in my mind and in my body and it's right. like been dwindled down to like here and I'm like just starting the like refuel that. So I'm just taking a lot of me time, like trying to cook more, blog more, like trying to read more books. So just try to like refill that creative energy and see where it takes me. I'm really excited actually. I feel good. Okay. So what, where can people check it out? What are the websites they could check out your blog and then also the Foodist? Yeah. So you can learn more about Foodist and read all my nice reviews and watch the trailer and stuff at foodist.com. And you can go to Summer Tomato to see my daily tips and tricks and hang out with me and leave comments. And I'm, I'm pretty active in the comments on the blog, so you can definitely go there. Yeah. And you can follow me on Twitter at Summer Tomato. Awesome. I'm active there, too. Yeah, and we'll link that up. So I have one last question, Daria. Thanks for your time. Um, I always like to ask the people who are very healthy what their biggest vice food is, like what you indulge most that may be extremely unhealthy. Jeez. Unhealthy. I mean, all relative. Okay. Yes. I Truth. guess that is. <laughs> real talk. Real talk right now. I'm a huge, huge fan of burgers. Like, love them. I, like, once they put out this, like, one of the local magazines put out this list of, like, the 10 best burgers in the city. Mm-hmm. I ate all of them. <laughs> I, like, went and just, like, tried all of what them. What was the most outrageous one out of by far, my favorite actually is uh, this restaurant called Bar Jewels, and it's not outrageous at all, which is weird because I normally like like gooey, like I like weird pickles and stuff on my burgers. This one's just meat and like cheese, and like if you're feeling crazy, bacon and like a little aioli. But it is so unbelievably good. It is so good. And if I had to throw in a second one, like a second vice, because I don't feel like burgers are. I mean, they're heavy, but I don't really think they're that bad for you. Um, but like, man, I love a good croissant. Oh, so good. And I will just sometimes eat 
one. <laughs> <laughs> With chocolate or and yeah. More than one. <laughs> but usually, I'm usually traveling when I do stuff like that. Love it. Dari, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Everyone should check out Foodist, and I'm going to definitely get it on Audible and listen to it. And, uh, you know, have a wonderful day, and thanks again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Peace out.